This is a 1984 Maserati Biturbo, and it's the cheap Maserati. Now, all Maseratis get cheap as they get older, but this one is unusually cheap. You can usually find Biturbos in rough condition for just a couple thousand dollars. And Top Gear endlessly made fun of this car in a classic segment a few years ago. Today, I'm going to review the Biturbo and find out if it's really so bad. Before I get started, big news, this Biturbo is currently for sale, being auctioned live on cars and bids. This Biturbo is, well, twin turbocharged. It has less than 36,000 miles of manual transmission, and it's offered with no reserve. So once you finish watching this video, click the link in the description below to head over to the live auction for this Maserati Biturbo, where you can bid on it and buy it only on cars and bids with no reserve. All right, time for the quirks and features of the Maserati Biturbo. And I'm going to start with a little overview of what exactly is the Maserati Biturbo. So here's the deal. This was an entry-level Maserati model that was made throughout the 1980s and into the early 1990s. Think of it sort of like the Ghibli is today, kind of the entry-level volume model in the Maserati lineup. Throughout the 1970s and earlier, Maserati had primarily been making low-volume, very expensive sports cars, sort of like Ferrari, Lamborghini, Maserati. Then in 1976, Maserati got a new owner and they wanted to grow the brand, more volume, more sales, more money. And so they developed the Biturbo as a popular entry-level Maserati that more people could buy. So what's powering the Maserati Biturbo? What exactly is this Biturbo engine? Well, these came out in 1981 and early models like this 1984 Biturbo used a twin turbocharged 2.5 liter V6, about 185 horsepower and something like 210 pound feet of torque, give or take. Not huge numbers, but they would have been pretty good for an entry level vehicle like this in the early 1980s. Now, later biturbo models got a larger engine. It grew to a 2.8 liter biturbo V6, I think 1989, and power was something like 220 or 230. So the later models have more power than these earlier cars. Now, as for body styles, Maserati sold the biturbo as a coupe, this car, which was the most common body style, plus there was an available convertible called the Spider and also a four-door sedan. Now, later in the run, they started to make some updates. They changed the name from Biturbo and used a variety of different names for various different models that were all based on the Biturbo in one way or another. Various different cars, all running this sort of platform, general shape, and powertrain. The coolest was the Shamal, which was a very late production Biturbo with a wide body, as you can see, and a twin turbocharged V8 in this little car. V6 was gone, they stuck a V8 and a wide body on it, and the Shamal is really rare and really cool, and that helped carry the bi-turbo underpinnings on into the early 1990s before other Maserati models came out. So what exactly was the problem with the bi-turbo? Twin turbocharged 80s car, manual transmission, you probably think it seems okay, but this car has a terrible terrible reputation. So what was the problem? Well, there were a few. For one thing, anytime you bring out a car that takes a storied historical brand name and takes it to the masses, you're gonna get some pushback and some criticism. It happened to Porsche with the Boxster, it happened to Ford with the Mustang Mach-E, and frankly it happens to modern Maserati with the Ghibli. All right, time to stick a tube of toothpaste in a Maserati panel gap. All right, here we go. <laughs> it fell out. It's too big. We need a bigger tube of toothpaste. There we go. Tube of toothpaste in a Maserati panel gap. So the car already had that working against it. Then there were complaints about the styling. People called this car ugly. Now, personally, I have never felt that this car was ugly. It certainly has a very 80s design, kind of boxy and not really modern. And I think people didn't like that the design was carried into the 90s this way. Cars were starting to get swoopy and this one was still boxy. But frankly, I think this car is actually pretty attractive. Looks like a lot of 80s cars, the E30 BMW 3 Series, a lot of other stuff too. I've always found the Biturbo to be 
never ugly and at the very least kind of boring, but I kind of like it. The real problem though was reliability. The Bi-Turbo is the world's first production car with a twin turbocharged engine, which is an amazing feat except that you really didn't want the world's first twin turbo production car to be an Italian designed carbureted vehicle that was developed in the 1970s. That was never going to be a recipe for a reliable car that you could count on. And so these cars developed a reputation for terrible reliability and then they got really cheap when people didn't want to repair them and maintain them because in a lot of cases it was too expensive relative to the value of this car. And so I think a large part of the by Turbo's bad reputation stems from the fact that it wasn't exactly <laughs> reliable. But it is precisely because of that poor reputation that not all that much content is out there about the Maserati Bi-Turbo. Not that many people know that much about this car because frankly, these aren't that easy to find anymore 40 years after they first came out. So today, let's learn. And let's start with getting inside in the key, which is kind of cool. You have the Maserati Trident logo integrated into the hole where you put the key ring, which is kind of a neat little touch. And then to climb inside, you pull on the door handle, which also has the Maserati Trident as you can see, integrated into it, pull that, open the door, and then you see the door sill, which has a massive Maserati script and some more Maserati tridents, and then you look inside, and the floor mat has a giant Maserati Trident. And quickly you start to realize that this car is a lot like the Ghibli from the modern day. Basically, Maserati really wanted to try to sell their brand name, their heritage, their logo, but at a lower price to attract people to the cool Maserati brand. And they really made sure you remembered you were in a Maserati pretty much everywhere you looked. More on that throughout this video. But the other thing you quickly realize when you climb inside the car is the seats are absolutely ridiculous. These old school, vastly overstuffed, look like lazy boy recliner leather seats. These clearly hail from the days back before they knew about supportive seats. And they just thought the best seats were the ones with the most stuffing. So just make them fluffy. And that's exactly what they've done here. Vastly overstuffed, look like Italian leather sofas, which was probably what they were trying to go for. In fact, the upholstery in this car is so overstuffed that they even made the center armrest full of this overstuffed leather to really emphasize the luxury leather appointments, I guess, that this car had. And where there wasn't leather in this interior, there was wood, massive wood panel on the door, as you can see, and then it stretches over to the dashboard, goes across the entire dashboard, and then goes on to the other door. So lots of wood and lots of leather in this interior. Carried on to the gear shift lever, which you can see the upper part is wood and the lower part is this leather shift boot which is tied up in like a bow to keep the shift boot in place kind of interesting although not the most interesting part of the shift lever that honor goes to the gear pattern at the top of the shift lever which you can see is arranged in a circle <laughs> It's a circular gear pattern. You're probably wondering how exactly do you shift gears in this car? And the answer is actually it's completely normal. You shift in a normal gear pattern like a normal car. They just decided to arrange the numbers this way in a circle so they could put them all centered around the Maserati logo because of course that's what they wanted to do. Now, maybe the most interesting thing about the gear lever situation in this car is it has a dog leg gear pattern, which means that first gear is to the left and down rather than to the left and up. If you go to the left and up, you will get reverse. And one important thing to point out is this car doesn't have a lockout, meaning you can go to the left and up hoping for first gear and easily find yourself accidentally in reverse, which isn't really an ideal position to be in, but that is the situation. You kind of have to pay attention and remember what you're doing. Now, moving up from the gear selector, you have, you can see the radio in here, the original factory radio, which is really, really impressive, hard to find in bi-turbo models. A lot of people replaced the radios over the years, but not in this car. You can see it's a tape player. It also has AM, FM, and some presets. Pretty standard radio from this era, but very interesting to see. You will also notice on the radio is another Maserati logo and the Maserati words 
spelled out. And on the speakers themselves, another Maserati logo. On all of the speakers, Maserati logo. Again, they really wanted to make clear that you were in a cool Maserati. Now, next, we move above the radio and onto the climate controls. This car does have air conditioning, which was a nice luxurious feature at the time. And the climate controls also include a Maserati logo. It doesn't seem like there's any purpose for that to be there, but it is there, stuck in the corner of the climate controls, a full-color Maserati logo, because they stuck it pretty much everywhere they could. Now, one interesting thing about the climate control situation in this car, you have little sliders next to the climate vents that let you open or close the vents like you do on basically every car. The weird thing here is they don't, they don't exactly make clear what they do. So you can slide it down, and then you have an image of a vent, or you can slide it up, and you have an image of a vent that is green. They, neither one shows that it's closed. I honestly don't know which is closed closed and which is open. I don't know why they chose to represent it that way instead of, instead of the many other ways they could have done it, but that was Maserati in the 80s. Now, also in this center area, you have a clock, which is just kind of stuck on here, not integrated into the design at all, but you would have a digital clock in the center with a red button. doesn't really look all that correct in the middle of this wood and leather interior, but it was probably the easiest way for them to get a clock in this car. But anyway, next up, we move on to the gauge cluster in the Bi-Turbo and what is in the very center of the gauge cluster staring right at you? Why? It's a Maserati logo, of course, because why would it be anything different? Now, also in this gauge cluster, you have a turbo boost gauge, which would have been really cool in 1984. This was before basically anything was being turbocharged, and it's very special to see a turbo boost gauge from the factory in there. Definitely would have felt like a cool thing. Now, less cool in this gauge cluster is the fact that the car is currently stopped and turned off with the key out and yet the speedometer is showing 17 miles an hour and the tachometer is showing about 500 rpm and it's important to point out these gauges aren't broken they are actually resting on the pin that pops out to keep the needle in place at 17 miles an hour and 500 rpm this was by design Maserati designed this car so that when it was off the speedometer showed 17 miles an hour power rather than zero. That's how it was intended to be. And that gives you an idea of the quality of the engineering and design of this vehicle. And another rather odd design decision, this car has power locks. You won't find the button, but it has power locks. I say that because the button is hidden here in the driver's knee area, completely out of sight from everybody and out of reach from the passenger. That is where they've integrated the power locks button. This is especially unusual because there are a bunch of buttons around the gauge cluster that are blank, that could have served as the power locks button, but instead they chose to hide it in the driver's footwell area so it cannot be seen. Now, speaking of the driver's footwell, worth pointing out, the pedals have Maserati logos. And you can see not just on the accelerator, but the accelerator, the brake, and the clutch, all three of them have Maserati logos because they jammed that trident everywhere they could in this car. Now, with that said, there is one piece of good design that I like in this interior, and that would be the dome light situation. You don't just have a fixed dome light like everything else. Instead, you can move it around so it can shine in the driver's lap or it can shine in the passenger's lap, which is pretty cool. A movable dome light, although as I think about it, a lot of automakers get around the issue of driver versus passenger dome lights by just having two. One for the driver, one for the passenger. Maserai decided to have one, but it moves. So you have to argue over who gets the dome light. So maybe it's not really good design after all. Now, also interesting, and on the ceiling of this car, if you lower the driver's sun visor, there are instructions for how to use a turbocharged vehicle. Basically, it says, let the car idle for 15 to 30 seconds before shutting it off in order to preserve turbocharger life. Of course, in modern cars, they're all turbocharged. You don't get warnings like this but back in the day this car was on the frontier of turbocharging and they felt a warning label like that would be important for their customers but anyway next up another interesting item in this car like i mentioned there are some buttons around the gauge cluster it has some interesting functions one of them is marked test and if you press that button it will light up all of your warning lights and that way you know that they work and then you release the test button and they all turn off or at least they're supposed to and the theory there is if a light doesn't light up then the light is broken and so you don't know how that system is doing in the car. If the light lights up and then turns off, then it has run the test and you know that that system is fine. And so that gives you an opportunity to 
see how all your vehicle systems are doing. Now, you also have a button over here to pop open the fuel door. You press that and the fuel door opens, except that it doesn't. I'm standing here and you can see it's closed. Nothing is happening. So what's going on? Well, that's because the fuel door is over on the other side with a Maserati logo, of course. You press the fuel door button, you can see that fuel door pops right open, and that's where you put fuel. So what exactly is over on the driver's side if it's not the fuel door? The answer is nothing. I looked through the owner's manual trying to figure out what this is. It's never referenced anywhere, and it doesn't look like it opens. I think they just stuck that on there for symmetry. You have the fuel door on one side, might as well put the same thing over on the other side, and it gave them a chance to put another Maserati logo on the outside of this car. But before I get into other stuff outside the car, let's talk rear seats. Now, to get into the back seats, you just fold up the front seat, it moves forward, and then you climb in and sit down. It's really not all that bad, as long as the front seat is folded forward. <laughs> if you put the front seat back so someone can actually drive the car, you'll notice the rear seats are quite small. Although, like I said, this was also offered as a sedan. So if you really did want four seats, you could have it. And Maserati offered a larger sedan, which was called the Quattro Porti at the time this car was out as well. So you could get a bigger sedan too, if that's what you wanted. But if you got the coupe, the back seats were still pretty luxurious. For one thing, the same overstuffed leather that you had in front. The Lazy Boy Italian leather sofa leather is back here, except in the middle seat, where you have this other substance that looks like Alcantara, actually, that goes all the way down the seat bottom and the seat back. Now, interestingly, this is a middle seat. It has a seat belt, and so you can seat three people in the back of this car, five total in the bi-turbo. Other nice luxuries back here, it has a climate vent, which you didn't often see see in coupes in the 1980s, and frankly, you still don't. You also have the Maserati speakers back here with the Maserati logo on them, and you had little vent windows back here, so you could pop open the window and get a little bit more air, which was a nice luxury in a coupe. But by far the most interesting luxury back here is the rear sunshade. A lot of modern luxury cars have a rear sunshade. You push a button, the sunshade goes up, and it shields you from the sun. In this car, you have manual rear sunshade individual for the back seats. So you lift them up here, you lift them into place, and then you clip them like above the rear window on the headliner, and then you have a sunshade. And you can do the same thing over on the other side, and then your sunshades are up, and you're shaded from the sun in back. A little difficult to get back there and actually do it, but you do have rear sunshades, manual individual ones in this car. But anyway, next I'm moving back outside the bi-turbo. I want to talk trunk. Now to open up the trunk, there's a little latch in the driver's door jam. You pull on that, the trunk pops open, and you open it up. One interesting thing, there is no trunk lock on this car. You don't have a lock on the vehicle itself. Instead, the lock is on the trunk latch. You could lock it there, and then people couldn't open the trunk, which saved Maserati from having to put an ugly lock on the outside of the car. But open up the trunk, and you can see it's just a trunk. Nothing especially unusual or exciting or interesting back here, except on the inside of the trunk lid, you pop open this panel, and you have a tool kit. This is the original toolkit that came with this bi-turbo. You could do roadside repairs if you had to, and if you had one of these, well, you probably had to. Now, on the, on the outside of the car, on the trunk, you got Maserati over on the left in huge font to make sure everybody knows what you're driving. On the other side, it says bi-turbo, and you can see above that, there's a badge that says intercooler. Looks like a totally different font. That's because these cars weren't sold with an intercooler from the factory, but they had some overheating issues and so a lot of people added them after the fact. In fact, a lot of dealerships added them before the cars were ever even sold new in order to make them more reliable, and then they would stick on badges like this to let people know you had an intercooler. Now, other items on the outside of this car worth pointing out, not really all that much, actually. I already gave you my opinion of the styling. Frankly, I think it looks kind of cool. This boxy 80s look is starting to come back, and I never really felt this car was ugly. But there's nothing particularly controversial or unusual or exciting about the design, although I do think it's kind of neat. And next up, we move under the hood. Like I already mentioned, 2.5 liter twin turbocharged V6, about 180 horsepower. What I didn't mention is Maserati logo. Maserati logo. Maserati logo. 
because of course there is no real surprise. But now it's time to see what this car is like on the road. Very curious, one of the most hated cars of its era, one of the most hated Maseratis. Let's see if it's really that bad. All right, driving the Maserati by turbo. I say that kind of jokingly because this car has such a rep. It has been so scorned for so long and I'm thrilled to drive this one, particularly because this is the nicest bi-turbo in the world. And I say that in spite of the fact that the headliner is sagging, that the trunk latch doesn't quite open the trunk. It's like a two-person job, and that there are some rust bubbles on the outside. In the interest of full disclosure, all of that is going on, and yet this is still <laughs> the nicest bi-turbo in the world. The truth is, nobody really saved these cars. Nobody thought to preserve them. Nobody cared to preserve them. Saving the bi-turbo wasn't really something people wanted to do. It was the entry-level Maserati. It never got an enormous amount of love, and so it's difficult to find these cars in anything representing nice shape. And this one is pretty nice. I'm gonna take an unusual and maybe contrarian position here. I kinda like this car. Um, for one thing, they're cheap as hell. Now they're probably very unreliable. They probably have a lot of issues, but this one, everything works pretty well. The car drives well. And, and I drove a bi-turbo last year also for a video that never ended up going up. And I have to say in both cases, I kind of am impressed with the way the car drives. Now I'm not talking about the ownership experience, the reliability, the interior layout, any of that, just the way it drives. I don't think it's so bad. It has manual steering, so low speeds, you're really fighting it. But at speeds like this, I'm going down curvy roads, it's fun. Like, it, you really feel a lot of weight to the steering, weight to the car. It's reasonably well balanced. It's a small car, doesn't have a lot of body roll. You feel like you could really goose the throttle in corners because there's not enough power to get into a lot of trouble. But there's still enough power to make the car feel more enjoyable and exciting. Now. Later by turbo models got, a, models got a bigger engine with more power. I mentioned that before. I drove last year a bigger engine, one with more power. It drove better. It was more fun, more exciting, but those are more uh, expensive. And frankly, they're just harder to come by. This car, is fun. It's like not so bad. I think the problems with the bi-turbo were never the way that it drives. And in fact, if you look up all the bi-turbo complaints over the years that journalists have done, that Top Gear has done, they rarely complain about the driving experience. It was kind of a fun car to, to use. The clutch and shifter are nice. Like I said, the steering is good. The power is nice and the power delivery is fun. Um, you know, this old school turbo kind of kicks in late, kind of throws you back, but there's decent low and mid-range power, which isn't true of my Audi RS2, which came out 10 years after this car, and it has less, it has more turbo lag and worse power delivery. This car is a lot more linear, linear throttle response, despite the old school twin turbo. The driving experience is good. I like how this car looks. Um, that was never the issue. The issue was always the dilution of the Maserati brand because this car was a volume play rather than like a, you know, beautiful, like the Cams and the Bora and the Maroc. Those were all true sports cars. They're mid-engine, they were rare. This wasn't. And I think that had a big effect on, on this car's popularity. And then there was the reliability problems that came. But if you're willing to go in with your eyes wide open about what this car is and the issues it'll have, I think you get like an increasingly kind of cool car in the sense that it's like a classic Italian manual transmission car, all of which are becoming more desirable and more valuable. Well, here's your chance to get one on the cheap, like kind of a vintage Italian sort of sports car. Um, and they're all unreliable. I think people just scapegoat this one particularly because it was so cheap that it never made sense to repair some of the issues. Whereas Ferraris had a lot of the same issues or worse ones, but they were valuable cars. So people had more money than they fixed them. But anyway, that's my contrarian and, and, and bizarre take on the bi-turbo. I don't hate this car. I don't hate how it drives. I don't hate how it looks. I kind of think it's a fun car when it's running right. And this one is running pretty right, and they uh, not all of them are. <laughs> so this car is kind of special in that regard, and it's kind of fun when, when you find a bi-turbo that's working to drive around, especially because you can pick these up so cheap. And so that's the Maserati bi-turbo. I've driven a few of these now, and I've been surprised each time that they're not really all that bad to drive. And frankly, I think they're not all that bad to look at as well. But I haven't owned one of these, so I can't really speak to the reliability of this vehicle, but that's something that you can find out if you buy this bi-turbo on cars and bids. Anyway, now it's time to give this bi-turbo a Doug score.
And the Doug score is here, 43 out of 100, which places the Bi-Turbo here against some relatively similar cars. The Bi-Turbo scores interestingly, especially losing out in quality, but the fun factor and cool factor are reasonably high for a car like this, and they're increasing with its age. The Bi-Turbo isn't the best Maserati, but it's a quirky car with a storied history, and I'm thrilled I finally had the chance to review one.